Hello and welcome to RCSI University of Medicine and Health Sciences. I'm Dr. Mary Collins and I'm delighted to be here with you. Today we are going to discuss positive aging retiring well. This panel discussion forms part of RCSI's My Health series. This series explores a wide range of areas in health and well-being and brings together some of the leading healthcare experts in these fields. The overall goal is to empower people with the knowledge to make informed decisions about their own health and well-being. We received a number of questions in advance of this session, so thanks to those of you who submitted those questions, and we will weave them into our discussion for this session. Today, I am delighted to be joined by Dr. Trudy Meehan, Trudy is a senior clinical psychologist specialising in child and adolescent mental health and lecturer at the RCSI Centre for Positive Psychology and Health. And welcome to Professor Robert Kelly. Robert is a senior lecturer in medicine at RCSI and a consultant in cardiology and lifestyle medicine at the Beacon Hospital. Welcome to the RCSI My Health series. So Trudy, let's get started with you. You have referred to retirement as being a process, not an event. Can you tell us a little more about that, please? Thanks, Mary. I think it's a really important point and often something we don't really think about. We see it as a point in the future that we get there and a destination, but it's really a journey and a process. And research shows that people who put planning and effort and thought into this process of getting there retire more successfully or experience the, the event of retirement more successfully. And really that means that one of the things is that retirement's very variable for different people. So the research is interesting in that some people experience it as very challenging, other people really enjoy it. But one of the, a few of the things that feed into our experience of retirement are the things that happen before it. So for example, how do we usually deal with change? Retirement's a transition phase. If we don't deal with change very well, usually likelihood is that during retirement, we're not going to deal with that very well. So we really need to be mindful of how we manage transitions generally. Mm -hmm. And to become, as best as we can, a little bit more flexible, mm -hmm. both in our ability to change our behavior, you know, when unknown things come up, but also to plan for variety and to weave some variety into our life so that we're more than one person and we have more than one role. So, you know, for example, a lot of people rely on their occupation as their primary role. Retirement can upend that. And so a lot of people benefit from having a variety of activities, more meaning and purpose coming up to retirement. But also when we see it as a process, it means we don't need to end work at the retirement point. What opportunities are there to carry over some of our original identity as, you know, from our work life? and to develop this new identity. And I know, Mary, you've done some research on the multi-generational workforce. So maybe, maybe that's a place where people can carry on their work identity while they're also transitioning into a new space. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that transition piece and being flexible and adaptable and preparing well for the next phase of life. So there's a lot of research that has been done on older workers. And I really do believe that we need to leverage the strengths of older workers. Um, for example, mentoring is a fantastic way of working with younger generations, and they need that more than ever now, particularly in this hybrid world. So, you know, allowing um, workers who are coming up to retirement to actually share all the deep smarts they have. Um, Professor Dorothy Leonard in Harvard talks about that wisdom and the deep smarts of older workers. So providing opportunities through mentoring, training, coaching in the workplace. Um, and again, that's important to keep developing and keep learning um, right until the last day of work and beyond. Um, and Trudy, can I just ask, you mentioned the importance of planning and preparing. When do you think people should start doing that? Yeah, I, I think it's a great question. And the, the research shows that at least two years out, you should be doing that. But we know from studies on well-being that when we have purpose and meaning and we have good relationships in our lives and when we experience moments of joy and we're engaged in things, we're, we're better off. 
So those are things we should be including in our lives now. So regardless of what age you are, and often people think that aging is something that only happens after a particular number. Yes. But we're constantly aging, we're constantly changing and transitioning and dealing with life changes. Mm -hmm. And the more buffers we have in terms of personal skills, mm -hmm. resources in terms of social connections, um, and also community resources that, and a variety of roles that we can step into. Mm -hmm. That's really important for wellness and well-being across our lifespan. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to start thinking about ageing as a lifespan process mm -hmm. rather than an end-of-life process, if yes. that makes sense. Absolutely, absolutely. Great. So, Robert, just to come to you, how important is it to look after your health as we age? So Mary, that's a really important question. Um, it's really important to look after your health because as you get older, you're more prone to get heart disease, cancer, strokes, and, and conditions like Alzheimer's disease. So most patients do not want to develop any of those conditions. And one of the interesting things about retirement, unfortunately, is you get a huge increase in the risk of having a heart attack or having a stroke almost immediately after you retire compared to people who continue in the workplace. Right, that's really interesting. And why is that, Robert? Well, some of it, I think, is because people don't actually look after their health in the earlier phases of their life. I mean, Trudy mentions a process that should be continuous through life, that age shouldn't define it. And so the vast majority of people, unfortunately, don't pay attention to all the different factors that give rise to heart attacks and strokes and the other conditions. Yes. And can you take us through some of those risk factors, please, Robert? So the big risk factors for particularly for heart disease and strokes, relate to control of your blood pressure, mm -hmm. um, what your blood sugar levels are like, so whether you have diabetes, or what your cholesterol is like. But the other factors that are much more important which relate to those as well is how you look after yourself. So mm -hmm. whether you have a healthy, balanced diet, what you eat, mm -hmm. um, whether you take physical activity, whether you actually get a good night's sleep, what's your capacity to handle stress, and Trudy also mentioned a lot of the more kind of social connections and the friendships you have in life, which are really critical as you get older, as are a lot of the psychological aspects because the optimism and the gratitude do overlap in how you manage your physical health. Great. And what are some things that people can do practically, Robert? What are some of the preventative measures? So the preventative measures fall under the whole gamut of what we call lifestyle medicine. And lifestyle medicine is this entity that's much more holistic to patients, that you deal with the patients. Instead of being the doctor that we tell you what to do, we actually engage with you, the patient, and try to get some better scope in terms of what it is that leads to your health problems as much as from your health issues, but your personal issues, your emotional, your psychological issues, the situation at home, the environment you live in. And so there are lots of different things that you can do for your physical health. So from the, the actual, my level of interest from a heart patient, um, clearly if you take some exercise every day. So what heart disease recommends is that you do at least 30 minutes of moderate pace walking every day. Mm -hmm. When you get older beyond retirement, what you really want to be doing is adding weight training to that. So mm -hmm. that could be lifting the shopping in out from the car every day or going to the garden and doing things. Mm -hmm. uh, importantly, that you don't push yourself to a level that you get hurt. Other measures would take on, say, eating habits. So a balanced diet, the best model in this part of the world is the Mediterranean diet, has been shown scientifically to be good for longevity, to be good for reducing the risk of heart disease, of cancer, and Alzheimer's disease. Some parts of the world, people like eating vegetarian, plant-based diets. Um, in terms of sleep, critical. So it's really, really important that you're sleeping six or eight hours at night not less and not more and there is a reason to that because if you have poor sleeping habits I'm afraid you up the risk by about a third of having a heart attack or a stroke. So you want to get a good night's sleep Now, clearly as you get older you run into trouble with going to the toilet late at night so there is an element of not drinking so much late at night but there's also an element that if you go to bed and you have to get up and go to the bathroom you come back to bed and go to sleep that that counts as part of your six to eight hours. It's also really critical that you're not eating late at night, that you're not drinking late at night, and that you're not drinking coffee too much late in the evening, because all of those things will keep you awake. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're under a lot of pressure, and this overlaps with the stress side of things, and you're bringing work home, and you're on the mobile phone, these are all things that you should really try to turn off and switch off from much earlier in the day to give yourself an element of calmness going to bed at night. Mm -hmm. The final pillar, I suppose, relates to stress. It does have a psychological aspect, 
There's a lot of stress, as Trudy mentions, transitioning from retirement to, to non-retirement. Uh, I think there's a lot of issues around uh, dealing with grandchildren and your own family in terms of what's going on in their lives. You have to deal with your spouse who may not be in full physical health. Um, and there's also that kind of uncertainty about the future. So there's a lot of different things like that that do require, I think the connection and having other people in your life is hugely powerful to help you in that respect. And I think if any of those issues, if there are medical concerns, and I often say, I mean, when you come to this age in life, you should be seeing the doctor every year. You should be going for that medical, having your bloods done. You should be doing the screening programs. You should have the blood pressure and the cholesterol and the blood sugars checked because you can prevent a lot of those things on lifestyle medicine. You can prevent yourself getting sick. You can defer getting sick till 90, I have patients in their 90s. I have three 103 year old patients. Wow. They do have heart disease, but they're still very much alive and yeah. well. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. And Robert, from your clinical experience, what have you noticed about patients that have retired? What are some of the, the changes you've noticed in them? So I, you know, I think, it's fair to say that the people who have very focused and have purpose in life will get out of bed every day. They have a routine, they'll go off and do things. So some may go to the gym, others may have activities that they do. A lot of patients I would observe would have other interests. So some people will write books, other people will spend a lot of time, say learning a language seems to be a great way of, of preserving age. Um, and I think they have a very much scheduled way of doing things. They also tend to take one thing at a time, which is critical. And you know I have a particular interest about habits and getting people to change behavior. One of the big challenges as people get older is just having the motivation to do things. I mean, it's great having purpose in life, but if you're not interested in getting out of bed, or if you're not interested in going for a walk, then you have to find a much more simple way to do this because Motivation doesn't work all the time. It changes a lot. You may be in the mood to do one thing one day, not the next day. Whereas what you need to do is literally force yourself. You have to get on and do it. So if it's the exercise, you have to get out there and go for the walk, no matter how wet it is, how uninterested you are. Because once you do that and you realize you're able to do it, you'll do it the next day and the next day and the next day. And the exercise is just critical. And all those other kind of lifestyle measures are critical if you want to live a long, healthy and happy life. Great, thank you, Robert. Trudy, is it normal to feel depressed around retirement? No, and I think it's really important to highlight this for people, and it's something I'm quite passionate about. Mm -hmm. There can be a lot of stigma around aging and retirement seen it often as a very negative thing. So if people start to experience low mood or, or feel very challenged, people can say, oh, it's just a transition, it's expected, you know, they're just having an existential crisis because they're getting older. But it's really not the norm. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important to highlight that for people. And if they're feeling particularly depressed, and, and when I say depressed, I mean an enduring feeling that lasts over two weeks. Not, you know, everybody has a day along the way and that's completely normal. And it's normal to have adjustment difficulties. And it's normal to feel a bit lost or a bit lonely at times during retirement. But to feel depressed over a prolonged period of time is not normal. And it, it's understandable at times. But the thing I want to say to people is there are options. And it's important to look for help and sometimes to look for professional help in those situations. Um, you know, I worked a lot of my professional life as a clinical psychologist in psychiatry of later life. So I'm very aware of the avenues that people can access and the success that people can have when they engage with the right services. So I would really encourage people to at first contact their GP. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a geriatrician can address some of the physical concerns. Um, and the geriatrician then, if there's no underlying physical concerns, can refer to psychiatry of later life. Um, there's also lots of resources in the community before the medical intervention is needed. But I think I would say to people, don't ignore it. You don't need to suffer and feel this bad. It's not normal. There's lots of help available and there's lots of community resources. Um, connecting with people, as Robert talked about, is really important. Tilda, the Irish Longitudinal Study on Ageing, looked at this quite a bit and they found that it's it's not normal to feel very low or to have thoughts of dying as you age mm -hmm. and they, they followed people who had thoughts of dying and they correlated it with clinical depression and high levels of loneliness mm -hmm. so there's usually a reason for these things to be there 
Um, and so I would really encourage people to not stay on their own and not suffer in silence. Yeah, great. Thank you, Trudy. And that whole area of social connection we've spoken about, what advice would you have for people who are feeling isolated and, and lonely and really want to create more connections? Um, the first thing I would say is that when we think about social connections, people often think about marriage, romantic relationships, f close family ties, and some people just don't have that. Um, so I would say don't lose hope if those aren't your options for connection. Mm -hmm. The work of Barbara Fredrickson, um, she looks at micro moments of positivity resonance, mm -hmm. and they're small moments of social connection that are life-giving and wellness-giving that we can get from contact with people in our community who aren't necessarily very close to us. So I think we can make small connections during the days um, by you know, getting out and about, by also attending clubs. But there's a lot of interesting research, again from Tilda, who have tracked Irish adults over a long period of time, looking at the benefits of engaging in creative activities. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's actually making creative pieces, like artwork or music, mm -hmm. but it might also be just going to the theatre reading for pleasure and um, you know watching a creative piece going to the art gallery mm -hmm. and they found that the older adults who rate highest in the amount of time they spend doing creative activities mm -hmm. report less depression a higher quality of life less loneliness and less stress and worry so i would really encourage people who are looking for connection to start with creative activities even if it maybe never occurred to you that you might be creative. We all have an impulse to be productive and to be occupied in some way. And a lot of occupational therapists, that's their area. But we talk about occupation in terms of work. But you know, there are other ways in which we can be meaningfully occupied. And I think we should start to look at that in our work life mm -hmm. and look at what other, what, what other strengths and talents we have. Um, and some of those might be creative. Wonderful, that's really interesting research from Tilda. Very compelling evidence there around that. Thank you, Trudy. Thank you. Great. So Robert, what about social connection and our physical health? Is there a connection there? Absolutely. So one of the most interesting and also alarming aspects of social connection is that people who are very isolated, who are lonely, have about a 30% higher risk of having heart attacks, strokes, and developing cancer. And this is particularly of concern after we've all been through COVID. And with the moments of cocooning that went on in the early phase of COVID, a lot of elderly people in particular were isolated from any contact with family, with friends, and that has subsequently led to a lot of physical ill health and mental ill health. One of the stories that patients will often share is that they've lost loved ones, their friends from their own social group who've died unfortunately during COVID, but others have actually themselves developed mental illnesses like Alzheimer's disease as a consequence of all the isolation have gone into care, and so patients will describe that they've lost three or fair, four friends from their community. Mm -hmm. And one of the other consequences of the isolation is it puts you off doing a lot of those positive health things we were talking about. So you might lose all your friends that you went walking with in the park every day, and so now it's up to you to find other people to, uh, to engage to get your physical activities back again. I think the micro uh, breaks are a wonderful idea in terms of uh, moments that give you connection with doing other people. And you know, being more creative and being more grateful that you're able to do things in life are very powerful predictors for, for longevity mm -hmm. and, and for better cardiac uh, health. Yeah, great. And Robert, what do you see working well for the people who come to you with cardiovascular issues that are of this age group? So I, I think what works well is about keeping it simple. I, I mean, these people do know how they've managed to get this far in life and what they've managed to do. Now, challenges come up, obviously. So there are challenges around pain is a big issue for older people. They end up taking lots of tablets, which sometimes is not a very good thing. A lot of people find difficulty sleeping. They take medications for that. And so you do have a huge increase in tablet use that's not the best for the older patient. You have issues around alcohol consumption, which in some cases is very significant. That's very disruptive to try and maintain your routine, but it's also very causative of things, particularly like high blood pressure, diabetes, weight issues. The weight issues in particular are shown amongst women to increase the stroke risk very significantly. So 
those measures are really, really critical. And I think it is simple to the fact of the Mediterranean diet, as I mentioned, is a very balanced, obvious diet. It's a diet that has a significant amount of vegetables, a certain amount of fruit, nuts, more fish and chicken and less red meat. Uh, so all of that is very, very scientifically balanced and very straightforward in most of the diet which we all should eat. It's just probably about eating lesser amounts of food, which older people tend to eat anyway. So it's just about getting the components to that. I think the activity side of things, one of the big things I see is people are afraid or tell you about falling. So it's really, really important that you do maintain some degree of physical strength. Now, you may not like going to the gym, or maybe you do. You can go and get a trainer who will help you with some degree of flexible or, or resistance or weight-based exercises. Mm -hmm. You may get that in the garden. You may get that by doing hobbies that you have. But it's really, really critical to do that mm -hmm. because you want a strong core so that your back is protected. Mm -hmm. You want to have some muscle strength because that's what you tend to lose as you get older. And you really want to have those things because they protect you against falls. Yeah. I mean, the biggest reason I come across older people getting into trouble later in life is they fall. Mm -hmm. They break things. They break bones. They slip in the bad weather. And then when they get hospitalized, they go on and they pick up infections that other people have. And unfortunately, that's often what defines lengths of life rather than all the other chronic conditions that they can actually manage through. Yes, yes. Thank you, Robert. So what I'm hearing there is to incorporate these activities into your everyday routines be that just going for a walk to the shops, as you said, doing gardening, lifting shopping bags or tins of beans, whatever it might be around the house, but to sort of make it part of your everyday routine and practices. I, I think what's important is to choose to be healthy. Mm. And I think if you choose to be healthy, there are millions of things that you can do every day mm -hmm. and you can keep a record of it yourself if you can't remember what to do, but it's, it's, it's simple things like that. Uh, you know, you may, a lot of parents get these Fitbits from their children as gifts, and so you may want to track your steps, and you may say, well, you know, I'm, I'm doing none this morning because I've not been very active. Maybe tomorrow morning I need to be more active to bring the number up, um, and, 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 and activities like that. But I think it's important that you do things rather than talk about doing things or rather than wait for other people to get well to do things. I'm afraid you have to go out. If it's raining, you have to take the umbrella. You have to be safe at the same time, but you have to do it. If you wait for reasons to think you should do it, the clock starts to ticking against you. Yes, yes, just do it, great. Um, and Trudy, if I'm a son, daughter, spouse of someone who's coming up to retirement, what can I do to help that person through the transition? Wow, that's a great question. And somebody like that would be lucky to have a son or daughter who cared <laughs> that much. But I think one of the key things around retiring or, or any transition is our mindset around it. Mm -hmm. Whether we have a positive mindset, this retirement is life enhancing, it's going to be a great thing, or whether we have a negative mindset, retirement is detrimental, it's going to lead to lots of health issues and, and all of this. But we get our mindsets, not just from ourselves, but from the social context we live in. So as a son or a daughter, it's really important for you to have a positive mindset around retirement and to talk about it in a positive light mm -hmm. and to support your parent or guardian or whoever is the adult in your life that you want to support that you support them by being positive around it, by talking about retirement as the beginning of something mm -hmm. rather than the end of something um, and really start to maybe help them make plans mm -hmm. um, and start to visualize and see the positives that are coming ahead. And, and that's really important, I think. So to be part of a community that sees retirement in a positive light so that the individual can have a positive mindset around it. Yeah, thank you, Trudy, that's great. I really like that. It's the start of something Okay, you're marking the end perhaps of a working life but the start of a new phase uh, and the language we use is very important as well isn't it yeah yeah definitely mm. the work of Aaliyah Crum at Stanford and I think anybody who's interested in supporting somebody in that way should just look up her work mm. on mindsets and it's really powerful to look at how we think impacts our motivation to engage in things it impacts how we feel about things but it can also impact on our actual physiology so it's really powerful um, so it's a really important thing to hold on to. Yeah, great. Thanks, Trudy. So, Robert, same question to you. If, if a son or a daughter is attending with their parent, what advice would you give them? So when it comes to their physical health, I do my very best with the family just to try and encourage to support the parents. Mm -hmm. 
I think it is important to keep them motivated. Now, as I said, motivation doesn't work, but just even to go for a walk with your parents, bringing your parents out to different family occasions, looking out for your parents, directing resources to your parents to help them out in a way that they can get through life. You know, they won't be able to do the shopping all the time. They may need some help even going out the door to walk. So just being there to support, being there is the connection. And most parents fully realize that they do not want to disturb their children, that their children have their own busy lives to live themselves, and they don't want to interfere in it. I think most children would like their parents to look after all their children so <laughs> that they don't have to do it. So there, there's a lot of give and take around this. But, but what parents enjoy in life is having that relationship with their family and being able to do things. So that, as we said, is critical to health. I think the other aspect is bringing your parents, say, to a hospital for, for their health checkups or bringing them to the doctor. And I think that where you don't have to do this all the time, you just set up a routine for your parents uh, who may not remember these things, may find it difficult to get themselves parking or get into the hospital because those types of things are so, so important to stay on top of that. And I think in general, uh, as Trudy says, is just trying to empower your parents and what's good for yourself in, in terms of that more optimistic, positive attitude because believe it or not, those things are extraordinarily important for your physical health and for your length of life. And Robert, that study that was done around loneliness and the impact on physical health, that it can be as detrimental as smoking, isn't that yeah. right? Yeah. And, and, and being very overweight as well. Yeah. So, I mean, most of these risks are all independent. So just because you have severe chronic stress in your life, the risk of having, say, a heart attack is much higher. Now, this extends across all age groups. And you see a lot of it in the pre-retirement population between 50 and 60. Um, but that's independent of whether you smoke or whether you're overweight or whether you have other medical conditions. So if you add all those two to the, to the mix, well, then your, your risk of having something nasty happen to you is pretty, pretty high. So, uh, you know, a absolutely true in what you say. So we've heard really, really great suggestions from Trudy around the importance of mindset and social connection and really looking after your psychological and emotional well-being and and Robert you've shared with us the importance of having a good diet of being active of just getting out there you know keeping that motivation up and ensuring that we are as active as we can be and also the importance of of community and social connection to your physical well-being so if I were to ask each of you if there was a key take-home message for anyone watching this who really wants for themselves or for their loved one to really support them in retiring well. What would that key message be? So Trudy, I'll go to you first, please. Thanks, Mary. I think the key message for me is to live well now. Mm -hmm. Don't wait until you retire to live well. Mm -hmm. So start creating a buffer in terms of activities, interests, social connections and meaning and purpose outside of your work life. Find an inner life, find outside activities that are important to you. And I think we all saw this during COVID when a lot of our work situations changed, or our social connections fell away. We found it hard to occupy ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to find things that are meaningful right now so that when we get to retirement and we have more time, we can just expand those activities and those interests and those meanings rather than look for them at that point. Wonderful. Thank you, Trudy. Thanks. And I also don't want to lose that key point you raised around creativity. And maybe one of those activities could be in the arts or any creative activity. And Robert, what about you? The key take home message? Well, I think Trudy's just given the, the key to take home message for everybody, which is just to live well and stay young. And if you do that, then you'll live longer. So, you know, what Trudy said, the only thing I would add is to do it. I think that if you wait and think about it, you'll never do it. So go out and do these things now and you'll realize that there'll be huge reward in actually doing these things that you want to do more of. So part of those activities will be physical activities. Part of those activities will be the choice of what you eat or where you eat. Part of those activities will be that you go to bed at a certain time every night and you get a full night's sleep. And part of those activities will be how you engage with your family, your friends, travel, all those things that you look forward to doing in life that you should be doing now anyway. So, I mean, this is, this is from the, the whole way through life. You get it going from the, the whole way, as Trudy says, you know, you'll have a wonderful life. Mm -hmm. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Robert. So live well now is the key message from both of you. So my thanks to Dr. Trudy Meehan and Professor Robert Kelly. Thank you so much for joining us. Further details about upcoming events on the RCSI My Health series can be found on the RCSI website. You can also find the RCSI My Health series episodes across all major podcast platforms. From all of us here at the RCSI University of Medicine and Health Sciences, thank you so much for joining us.